I guess we will will start now. Um, yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for for joining um, to this session at the IID Development and Climate Days, with the title "How Can Local Actors Innovate Effectively for Inclusive Climate Resilience in Informal Settlements?" And I'm really um, glad to have for this topic. Um, as co-hosts, um, some some really interesting organizations from around the world. Um, so we have Future Yetu from Kenya. We have Badabong Sangu from Bangladesh. We have Tree Adoption Uganda, and we have Action for Women and Children Concern from Somalia. Um, they will co-host uh, this session together with us. Uh, we are Citizen Alliance. My name is Arne Janssen. Uh, I'm leading the global program on climate change and informality at Cities Alliance, and I'm here together with my colleague Gabriela Violi Mercurio, and we will um, facilitate uh, hopefully um, rich discussion because uh, our co-hosts uh, have a lot to share um, on experiences from the ground on exactly these 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 topics. Thanks uh, also to IID for the opportunity um, to host this session um, this morning. I would just briefly go through the event structure so everybody knows what we are trying to, to do when. Um, so we will start with a really brief um, presentation by Gabriela, um, who will set the scene and will talk a bit about the background, why we at Cities Align think this is a, a really important topic. and. Uh, how we understand um, climate resilience. Um, so afterwards, we, we enter into a conversation around three main concepts. Um, first one will be around practices to engage local communities in actions around climate change, including adaptation and resilience. The second one is more considerations around multi-stakeholder engagement. So um, how can we include vulnerable communities local governments and even the private sector um, in, in a rather informal environment we are working in. Um, and then we, we would like to, to also um, lead this conversation into providing some examples of how modern technology can help to promote um, these, these, these actions. And we will hear from the organizations that are present today and they will share some of their experience and, and, and practices, what has worked and maybe also what, what, what didn't work quite well around people-centered and inclusive action. Um, but we also, of course, want to hear from you, from the audience. So um, we think it would be best if you could put your questions or comments you have into the chat function. And we will try to, during the whole event, to, um, to bring these questions into the debate and maybe even ask you to, um, to present your question at some point. Um, yeah, then we will uh, hopefully have a little um, summary at the end where we hope we invite all of you to, to share also with us what, what, do you, what did you learn in this 90 minutes slot? Is there anything um, you want to, want to um, that, that maybe sticked out of the conversation? So everybody is invited to to make some comments there as well. Um, so without any additional uh, um, losing any time here, I will hand over to my colleague Gabi, who will who will um, give a brief presentation and setting the scene. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, welcome again. Thanks for joining the session. My name is Gabriela Mercuru. I am an urban analyst at Cities Alliance and I manage our innovation program. So I will briefly introduce you to who we are and what we do in Cities Alliance and provide you with some background information on why we came to have the session today. I'll try to be very, very, be very brief in my presentation as well because really we want the focus to be on the group discussion later. So Cities Alliance is the global partnership fighting urban poverty and promoting the role of cities. It operates a multi-donor fund and is hosted by UNOPS. 
So we are a membership-based organization with a diverse set of members, from international NGOs to local government associations, multilaterals, national governments, and many more. We operate both at the country and global levels, and also have this initiate an innovation mechanism that um, can address topics in different um, in different regions and also a variety of topics. Um, but before moving forward. I would like to ask you, I would like to ask the audience, what is innovation for you? Because this is such a buzzword and it is also included in the session's title. But when you think about innovation, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And this is truly one of those questions that there is no right or wrong. So if you could just write a few keywords in the chat, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about innovation, you will let... Uh, a few seconds for that. Thinking out of the box. Very good. Anyone else? Something that is new, something that is effective, creative solutions. Very good. Disruption. Okay. Okay, um, these are very good. Um, it is a very difficult definition, right? It's, it's something, it's a very difficult exercise to define what is innovation. Um, but if you think about it, it's also all about reference. What point of reference you are adopting for your definition. So we have here smart and affordable solutions, um, a technique to a problem, very good. So, in Cities Alliance, we adopt a context-based approach to innovation, which is also centered in people. This means that we need to be very conscious and adjust our point of reference as well when we analyze and we evaluate the proposals that we receive and that will be funded. So for us, it has to be innovative for that specific context, which is a context of informality. So we are talking about um, innovation in informal settlements, um, also about the informal economy. So the innovations that we are looking for, they must be transformative, um, not necessarily disruptive, uh, but they must have an aspect of inclusiveness and also allow dialogues and networks, something that will bring change um, in the future as well. So normally in the media, when we hear about innovation, there's usually this link to technology. There's a lot of talk focused on frontier technologies as well. And I believe that some of them have great potentials if employed responsibly, but that's not necessarily the only thing that we are looking for. So we have been seeing and looking for, you know, more and more how modern technologies can help the social and economic transformation and be employed with and at the benefit of the urban poor. But one of the key aspects is that technology methodology or the approach that is chosen needs to work for the local community involved in that intervention. So it needs to add value for the user and for the beneficiaries of that technology. So we don't fund innovation um, just for the sake of it. Um, and here the context-based approach plays an important role because we need to consider the digital divide, um, potential literacy among the community that uh, you're working with the availability of ICT infrastructure, or even how affordable the hardware that you want to use is. So if we want to work in formality and informal settlements, we need to understand it and we need to be inclusive in our approaches and our understandings as well. Um, also, one of the findings from, from this work that we have been conducting uh, over the years is that the development and implementation of technologies can be a key driver for equitable and responsible responsive um, urban development that is not news, right? Um, but the effective adoption of technologies and the positive impacts from their use is really strengthened um, when their implementation is embedded into a broader framework of social dialogue, of inclusion, and of multi-stakeholder engagement. So it is not just the tech part that matters, it is rather the social one, and then the tech solution comes as a tool to support you to achieve the transformation um, that we are looking for. So what exactly do we do? So we want to promote the role of local communities in urban development and also stimulate, as I said, the use of simple and accessible innovations 
design to tackle the challenge that we are proposing as a topic. So for that, we have two components. One is we work with venture grants. So we work mainly with local organizations that are really rooted in their community. And we prioritize these small organizations that don't always have access to large funding sources. These grants, they are usually um, small in amount and short term. And we are seeing with this work that incremental solutions can have an important place in urban development. Um, that collaboration and partnerships is a very central aspect for all these initiatives. And so is the work towards gender equality. So you will see that reflected in the discussion. I am sure of that. Uh, and the second component is knowledge management. So we gather the knowledge from, from these individual, this individual projects. We translate these individual learnings into a global narrative. And we also, along the way, we also promote peer learning and provide networking opportunities for our local partners. Um, we have had already along the years a few uh, thematic initiatives, but today's discussion will focus on the one launched last year about adaptation to climate change. So why? Why, why this topic? Why are we working with um, climate adaptation at the community level? So first of all, um, because the urban poor is really being disproportionately affected by climate change, and this is for a number of reasons. For instance, Informal settlements are normally more exposed to climate hazards because of their location and also because of the availability and the conditions of the, the offer of services and the basic infrastructure. Also because of multidimensional poverty and structural inequalities and the lack of representation of the urban poor in urban governance. Um, we also selected this topic because we believe that supporting bottom-up Incremental interventions can contribute to wider climate action in the territory. So for those who want to go deeper into this topic, Citizen Alliance has recently launched a publication addressing ways in which informality intersects with climate change. So I will um, paste the link later in the chat. So through this specific initiative, uh, we were looking for actions that um, that were created and to be implemented at the community level and which would help people be more prepared and adapt to the impacts of climate change in the long term. So we have selected five projects. We have funded five projects. Unfortunately, we only have four of them with us today. Um, these were initiatives on the use of digital storytelling for awareness and advocacy in Kenya. Uh, waste management for flood control in Uganda, inclusive community-based disaster risk management in Somalia, digital mapping for the development of climate resilience plans in Bangladesh, and the use of um, citizen science for heat mitigation in Myanmar. So I will not present these projects on their behalf. We have their representatives here today. And during the discussion, you will have the chance to learn more, not only about the projects, but also about the organizations and the people behind them. Um, I will also paste in the chat, if you want to learn more about them later, um, a link to a website where you can find the compilation uh, of, of their work. So I was able to, that I hope I was able to contextualize this very quickly for you, today's discussion, and get, also give some points to help framing the discussion later. So Arne, over to you and thank you. Thank you very much, Gabi. And I guess this was, um, although we all work uh, uh, certainly uh, somehow related to, to the topic, it's always good to have a, a basic and, and a common understanding of, of, of what we discuss here today. And you mentioned already um, the different projects, and I'm really happy to, to, to hear now also from them directly. So with this, we turn into the um, conversation part and I would invite all of our panelists to turn on their cameras so we can have a, a better exchange, hopefully. And so the first question, as I mentioned before, will we'll, um, we'll deal with um, the community level, with the understanding of, with our understanding of, of, of community, of community building, of the social fabric, and um, what it takes to get communities engaged. 
but maybe we step even back uh, and and ask ourselves the question: the question, what is a community for for us? Right? When you say uh, we work at the community level, what do you really mean by that? Um, who or what defines the community? And I guess this is also a different from from each and every context, each and every project. Um, so I'm really uh, uh, happy to hear. Uh, your examples and your thoughts on, on this topic and maybe also how, how you manage to engage the communities that would be really of interest for us and I guess also for the audience. So um, before I ask uh, Angela from Tree Adoption Uganda, uh, I just want to let you know, I mean, all of you, uh, if you speak for the first time, you are also invited to, to, to introduce yourself in, in one or two sentences and uh, where you where you are based and and on what what you're working at the moment. So Angela, uh, I would ask you to to share your your first uh, thoughts on on the question regarding the community. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jensen. I am Angela. I'm from Kedotra, Uganda. We are working in Uganda. We are climate this NGO. We have I'm the legal counsel and also a field coordinator for the organization. Yes, we have been running a project to Cities Alliance in the informal settlement of Boyaisa in the city of Kampala. Yes, so my my experience community mostly translates into people a group of people living in the same area. How city but then also we have also noticed that communities go further than that they can they are so can there can be social units and communities they share maybe religion values and customs and all that so so from our work in voice eh, the community okay what we what to translate into the community what people living in the same area and they were affected by the same problem of floods. So for us, community in our context was getting these people living in the same area affected by a common problem. And that's how we got our own context of community. That's how we brought them together because they're all being affected by the same problems and effects of climate change. Yes, that's how we managed to get what the community in our context. So after recognizing the area where an area where people where people in that area were affected by floods and and climate change impacts, we decided that is a community. Then we further we took it further and divided all these informal settlements into groups of 10 clusters. And then we also formed their own community. So we put them in a certain kind of community, those 10 clusters of like 10 houses, we put them in one community. So we were working with them in those divided 10 clusters for the rest of our project. So for, for so from our part, the definition of community, yes, people living in the same area, that, that can be a community. People sharing same values, norms, religion, cultures, yes, that can be a community. But also people who are affected by the same problems, who are impacted by the same problems and also can form a community. And then also community can also mean depending on can also depend can also be defined depending on what is being done in the area so for us we we found the community there we living in the same place but we also subdivided them into small communities in order to implement the project and get them working together for the greater good for of the entire community thank you Thank you. Um, um, given your 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 actual project, um, so just a, a question for myself again. So you, the community was um, 
was uh, meeting already, right? So the community was there already, or did you have to to, to invest a lot in in in, in building this community, um, or was this more like uh, an existing community where you could then bring bring in a new topic and discuss it with with existing existing ways of of how to deal with it? The community was already in, in existence, and the problems that were affecting them were all known by the community. So for us to get into this community, we had to first carry out, go to the community, because in all communities here in Uganda, there are local leaders. So our first way into the community was through the local leaders. So we got in touch with some of the local leaders. We talked to them about what problems are affecting the community. They allowed us to carry out a baseline survey within the community members. So we, we kind of got similar problems and the highest percentage was the floods from all the community members. So that was our entry point. So the community was already there. We concretized, we concretized the problems affecting them through our baseline survey. We had to get the local leaders on board to help us and also and also guide us on how to relate to the community, how to divide the communities into the 10 different households. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Angela, for, for, for sharing this. And we will definitely come back to, to your project on this. Um, I would now um, ask Elizabeth from uh, Future Year to Kenya um, to share their experience. And if you would introduce yourself. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, everybody. I'm so glad to be part of uh, this discussion today. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Wamboy from Nairobi, Kenya. I work at Hope Phrases Initiative. Uh, I use the lead organization in Nairobi, Kenya, in Korogocho. Korogocho is one of the, is the fourth largest slum. Uh, in Kenya, with about 250,000 people living in four kilometers square. And uh, we have a lot of challenges involving on about climate change because uh, we are located next to the biggest dumping sites in the city. And uh, so to engage community, is it was very much easier because we were actually addressing the issues that were the issues that they have been going through the, on a daily basis. Uh, so we actually started with a um, baseline survey to, to actually survey if the community understands what, communi what climate change is. And for sure, they actually understood that way before because, like I said, it's something that is happening and they know that but these the way they define community the way they define climate change is actually different even the way they describe it they don't use the the actually the the normal terminology scientific terminology they don't understand that and um we had to even bring in the government, the county government, the environmental experts, so that they can explain to them those terminology because they don't actually understand understand those kind of uh, terminology. Um, and that shows that there was a gap between now the government and the science world and the community in that these people are describing they are describing uh, climate change in, in a different way from the other, and there was that gap that was, that was there. Uh, for instance, because of the dumping site, uh, there's a lot of burning of waste. So people actually talk about smoke. They don't talk about emission of gases, and they will tell you we are affected by, by they will tell you that we are affected by the smoke from the dumping site instead of telling you there are some emission from 
toxic emission from the dumping site, which is actually affecting our health. And as working on the ground, you have to actually understand such kind of language so that even when you're having a project, you can design a project that will address those kind of needs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Angela. So we've been hearing about, first of all, about the sense of community. So there are ideas about uh, the territory, let's say the territory boundary of communities, but also the social aspect of it. So when you really um, think about engaging people in a community, there's also a matter of, of trust that goes beyond that specific space, the limitations of space. And what I'm also hearing is that, you know, the mentions, mentions to climate change, they're really nowadays everywhere. We see them in the news, we see them in technical discussions, um, but several of these discussions, they really happen at a level that is very difficult for the individual to really grasp what's really um, happening on what, how we can really um, support how our actions can involve that. Um, so we see many discussions focusing on the level of emissions of countries or industries. And when we really come to the work, to work on this topic at the community level, what I'm hearing from you, uh, Elizabeth, is that there is this need to adapt the language that is used because the understanding is there but um, it seems like the actors, they're speaking a different language, although they may be speaking about the same uh, main common problem, right? And this is very interesting. And also following up on that, um, on whether, you know, how can people really, do they really relate to that issue of climate change um, and how this can also create future crises and impact their daily lives? How, how can we mobilize different stakeholders to act for adaptation. So not just the community themselves, but also create this multi-stakeholder engagement. So working with local governments, for instance, or with private sector, um, what, what were some of the entry points? Because all of you have done that. What were some of the entry points that you have used to reach that? Um, maybe Mamun, if you would like to talk about the experience in Bangladesh. So thank you, Gabby. And um, uh, well, uh, this is very uh, a strong point that um, how we can involve and engage all of the stakeholder uh, within a one platform, or they can coordinate with each other uh, for uh, making making it uh, making the platform workable. So, in fact, from our experience and being a climate affected country in Bangladesh and the Southwest region, particularly the Bay, that the Bay of the Bay of Bengal. So we have, um, we have experience to engagement with a, a different kind of stakeholders. And we found that if you go through the, uh, make a multi-stakeholder platform at the beginning level, it it not be a correct uh, or it, it it will take time uh, because there are different different level of capacities from the different stakeholders. Uh, for example, if you think about the citizens, the wider or greater citizens within the city, so uh, it's consist of uh, journalists, businessmen, service holder, private service holder, and a small businessman. So there are number of types and. Uh, they have very little or no connection with the informal settlement, like uh, who are living in the slum. And they have a very less communication with the public authorities. And uh, again, the youth community, they are less communicated with the other communities. So uh, the, uh, the correct uh, strategy, we don't say that it's a correct, but our Workable strategy is to start with the different group first. Uh, so mobilize the youth uh, with uh, engaging them, with the training, engaging them for the data collection, engaging them 
for advocating for the informal settlement. So then they, uh, when they are capacitated and when they are started to speak about the other stakeholder, then um, they can be act with the others group. So uh, our experience, we mobilize different group, different uh, separately fast, and then we manage them to act together, to coordinate them together. And uh, first of all, like uh, public authorities orient them about the climate change, uh, how they are planning, what is their budget, uh, what is their future plan for the climate change. So mobilize the public authorities, mobilize the differently the citizens, mobilize the youth, and again, the informal settlements, particularly the vulnerable community, the women-headed household, indigenous household who are living in the informal settlement. Uh, so mobilize them, build them capacity, and uh, we worked with them for uh, by weekly meeting, quarterly meeting, give them training uh, for building their capacity on articulation, their needs and priorities. And then they can start it to talk about uh, their needs and priorities, and they can uh, speak in front of the public. and. Uh, that is the one big chance and then they can act with the others group like citizens group they can act with the public authorities and they can uh, they can talk with the youth community also so and the our strategy and uh, we think that this is a what will strategy to engage with this first separately and then uh, make a common space for all of them and talk with them about the climate change in a different way and there are some strategy, for example, they uh, make a non-partisan attitude. So when we are working with the, all of the group, we make a non-partisan attitude with them. And, uh, the, and uh, they have a different language, like uh, what Gabby already mentioned, that each and every stakeholder, they have a different interest, they have a different language. Like when we are working with the public authorities, they have an interest what will be the infrastructure development within the slum. So then you can think about the what will be the drainage plan, what will be the exit plan, what will be the uh, safe space for the women and girls, what will be the water point. So th those are the main interest of the public authorities. Again, the uh, if you go with the citizen, then they have a different kind of uh, language and they have interest. So we we were very careful about the language and we another uh, another thing we like to mention here that the data driven um, discussion. So uh, we collected data by engaging the youth uh, within the community and data help um, data help to discuss about the each and every point. So data make make the connecting point for the a, a stakeholder also. So it's not only the uh, assumption, but also the data. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, engagement making a vision for uh, all of the stakeholders that what will be the vision of this plan and what will be benefit, what will be the uh, sustainability of the plan. So, these kind of things, uh, then there will be a coordination and uh, uh, ownership within the within the all of the stakeholder. Uh, within this uh, uh, time, within the uh, engagement of the stakeholder, we found that there are lots of risks and there are lots of crises also came uh, like COVID, uh, like uh, violence against women early child marriage and the, there are lots of stigma and if you think about the impact of the climate the uh, the fishing community with the big uh, big community in this area and also to some mangrove forest to tourism all of the things there are lots of crises is going on so within the crisis uh, you can uh, if you have a strong uh, platform of the stakeholder then uh, you will get support from different sites for the different crisis mediation. So uh, this is our experience uh, at a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mamun. 
one of the things that uh, you mentioned as well was the additional challenges and difficulties that you experienced during COVID because it added yet another layer of, of challenges, so another crisis. So I want to ask, also ask for you, um, for, for the group, so you all have a strong work engaging with the community and also the other stakeholders. But what changes and how were you able to um, to cope with some of the challenges brought not only by COVID, but I know that some of you, for instance, Somalia uh, is implementing uh, your interventions in a, in a very complex situation. You have violent, violent conflicts, for instance, and we also heard from some of you um, that may because of COVID and also other situations, um, risk of food insecurity, increases in gender-based violence and so on. So what does it change for your work and, and how did you have to adapt? So maybe Mamoun, if you would like to start, and then I would also like to hear about um, a little bit from Ahmed from Somalia on that. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh... Uh, very good question, and uh, we are uh, we are some time inspired to answer this kind of question. We we are now uh, as a, being a local organization, and we have a long term presence, and we are working with the uh, citizens groups, youth, women groups, and public authorities together, and uh, also the private sectors. So uh, we found that uh, uh, we. When we mobilize them, we mobilize them not only the issue of the climate change. And for the last two years, we faced a number of crises, which you already mentioned that the, the balance instrument crisis, uh, food crisis, there was an ad adequate food crisis, and also the um, early marriage stigma, and uh, is the other, uh, other crisis also, the unemployment. So, Within the crisis, we found that uh, these uh, groups and this platform is coming together and they are helping each other. And that's very interesting to see that we found that the oxygen cylinder, this oxygen cylinder support for the COVID patient, uh, for the COVID affected people, for the senior citizens, the youth group, they helped a lot. They came uh, forward as a volunteers and the citizens group, citizens committee, they moved they mobilized the resource from the other peoples and they funded that kind of support. And uh, food crisis, that is also, we found a good uh, instant, like this. Uh, government provided some support, the government provided ration, government provided some food uh, support. And that times we found that the women groups leaders, they also, they also managed to put the vulnerable women list with the communicating with the public authorities. So this kind of uh, situation and uh, the, the situation uh, crisis, when the crisis is come, then the stakeholder mobilization of the stakeholder is so up together. And I think it's not only about the um, climate adaptation, because adaptation is, we have to adapt each and every day. And uh, this is changing. And so we are uh, adapting. Uh, so. I think the crisis that also be solved, that also can be solved by the stakeholder groups also. Okay. Thank you. I invite now Ahmed, if you could talk a little bit about your experience uh, in Somalia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, thank you, uh, Gabi, for having me. I am Ahmed from Action for Women and Children Concern, AWC Somalia. Uh, we are basically involved in human rights, uh, advancement uh, projects for women, or uh, women advancement projects, etc. Uh, etc. Et so, our entry point was uh, for, for this particular project uh, was in fact that we are part of uh, uh, the network uh, Global Climate Health Alliance. Uh, which initially uh, shared uh, the, to us the opening of uh, this grant and uh, provided that action for women and children concern is also part of uh, girls not privacy network which tackles uh, uh, under age uh, marriage across the world 
Uh, so what we noticed in our activities was that uh, climate change is a, a major player when it comes to exacerbating underage marriage, uh, maybe across the world, particularly in Somalia, as a means of coping mechanism for people who are displaced by either climate change effects or uh, a combination of climate change effects and insecurities across Somalia. So in the past uh, few years, the uh, numbers of underage regardless of marriage due to people fleeing floodings, people fleeing conflicts, or people fleeing uh, droughts have been staggeringly disproportionately very high. So what we noticed was uh, that the opportunity to engage the community and uh, start discussing about what are the causes why the parents need to disown their uh, daughters at a young age. So we noticed that uh, the parents disowning the young girls see as an opportunity to relieve the burden of the girls' needs uh, on the parents on households. So uh, we noticed that communities who are not displaced are uh, likely uh, to continue maintaining their girl child in school compared to uh, households who have been displaced either by climate change or a climate change effects like flooding or droughts or a combination of both. As you know, as we discussed at the moment, Somalia is already unfortunately, like uh, maybe you have been following uh, by the media, is suffering from uh, effects of climate change, dire consequences, particularly droughts. Over 3 million households uh, almost one third of the entire population is uh, in need for urgent need for humanitarian assistance. After Afghanistan and Yemen, we are the second country that needs to be assisted uh, this year. And you understand back to last year when we have been implementing uh, this project, there has been floods. So uh, the consequences of this drought is uh, the prime consequences is uh, um, food insecurity and uh, food insecure households are highly susceptible to disown their younger girls to men in urban areas who have in somehow uh, come from who are returning from europe or america with good of a good amount of money to marry younger girls then uh, make, making use uh, the vulnerability of, of, of the households. not only people returning from outside somalia but also there are also people who are somehow well off within Somalia, who may exploit the vulnerabilities. So our entry point was, 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 was this. So we have uh, engaged the community. And uh, maybe you have seen our videos, our engagement was community was uh, very good. We have been engaging the local authorities. We have enjoyed a great sense of a project ownership. Uh, our initiative was uh, uh, some sort of cost effective. Uh, then later on towards the end of the project, we noticed that uh, we have done everything, but uh, what we were missing was to institutionalize uh, because we have introduced district uh, uh, community uh, disaster risk management. So what we missed was that institutionalization. So still we are thinking about, we, we, we did not abandon our communities, we are looking forward uh, finding a way to institutionalize. And uh, we noticed that uh, our actions are, 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 are very relevant and uh, 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 worked to build community cohesion, uh, raise community awareness, understand the consequences of climate change and how it contributes to forcing uh, families to disown their women. So uh, basically, our project was was diverse in terms of the issues it has been addressing. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed. I want to come back a little bit on the idea that um, some of you mentioned before about language being key, using the right language, and how this can also um, relate to giving different meaning, meanings to things that we are so used to. And I would like to then invite Angela from Uganda 
to talk a little bit about that because in your project, for instance, you have uh, focused on waste management. And this was one of the aspect of how you can transform waste into something that is has a direct benefit to this um, to the urban dwellers, to these families, these this households. How um, you could use this entry point to get them engaged and talk about um, changes that would be needed at the community level. Thank you. So before the implementation of the project, we contacted the local leaders in the area. So they allowed us to do a baseline survey in the area. And this baseline survey provided information of the problems that were affecting the community. The reasons they gave for the floods was was pointing to the poor waste management in the area. So from their feedback, they learned that poor waste management in the area was the leading cause of the floods in the area. So that was our entry point. So this was a problem that needed to be addressed. So we talked to the community leaders and interacted with them about what, what measures we had in place to control this for waste management. And then we also presented our project and our plan to them and they were on board. So our project methodology was the use of organic waste to make briquettes. And the, this and our approach was going to help solve the problem of poor waste management in the area. Because now instead of dumping the waste, as they used to in the area, now the waste became valuable to the community. So we were using organic waste to make briquettes, to make briquettes, and after making these briquettes, these briquettes would be sold still among the community members for what for profits. So on one on one hand, we're solving the problem of poor waste management. On the other hand, while well, we are providing an economic source to the communities in the area who would participate in this briquette making process, they would make these briquettes, they would sell them to get married, to get, get money. And then also on the other hand, we're solving the problem of climate change in a way that in this, in the, in the Boise area, this comes where we carried out this project, uh, charcoal was the main source of fuel energy in the area. So charcoal was being used for cooking and all kinds of domestic activities at home, like for cooking and all that. So providing an alternative for charcoal in the area would mean reducing the pressure that's being put on trees that are used to make these, to make, to make, to make charcoal that is used by, that is being used by the community. So the briquettes, so the whole waste management project now part provided three solutions, helping out the community in waste management by making organic waste valuable to the community. And not only making it valuable to the community, it also provided an economic source, a source of income to the community members, especially the women in the area who are unemployed and would stay in their homes. So this was an alternative source of income to them. And then also while playing our part in Reducing the pressure on first and reducing on the on the, climate, on the effects of climate change, the, the constant cutting down of trees to make charcoal. So we provided an alternative in form of rockets as a source of energy. It was a cheaper source. Yes, that is. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. I would like also to make a follow-up question to you because um, something that I found very interesting on how you had, how the team had to adapt during implementation. So I remember that the first plan was not to make the briquettes, but was to work more on this recycling side of it. And then a long project implementation after you had several meetings, several consultations with the communities as well, um, because of an already established dynamic in the community, 
you have all decided, okay, so let's change way and let's go then um, instead of working with the recycling, let's go with the briquettes. And then based on that, everybody started really seeing um, the benefits and the value of that. And another point as well that I would like you to talk a little bit more about was how women were central to that specific uh, project because of their relationship as well with waste, man waste management at the households le household level. So if you could just um, talk a little bit about these two points, that would be great. So on the first point why we had to change the, the direction of the project. So like I, I said, we received feedback from the community. We did the baseline survey. We talked to the community leaders about the, the, the waste management projects in place. We looked at the, the KCCA, that is the authority in charge of the area, their waste management programs and all, and we found that briquette making would be a, a better option for the community. And this option would not require a lot of campaigning on their part. So this, so this solution involved brought the community together. This, this solution had uh, brought the community together. It helped the community work together. And this, and this solution was also a source of income for the community. And in a way, it was also playing a role, helping the community play a role in averting the effects of, of climate change. So this, the briquette making was, from the feedback from the community, the briquette making project and angle we took was more beneficial to the, to the community and the community was responding more to the briquette making process than the recycling project we had, we had previously suggested. And then the, on the second question, so the women in, this, in these areas usually stay home. They don't, they're unemployed, so they're, so they're usually at home. So they're, so women in this area, well, ordinarily take care of the home setting, everything to do with the home domestic work. So they are usually in their homes. And when these floods come in, they're, they're the ones who are the most affected in the area because they're the ones at home with the children and taking care of all the domestic aspects of home life in this particular slum. So the women, so the briquette making project spoke more to the women because did not require them to move away from their homes. They could do it from their homes. The meetings were close to their homes so they could attend the trainings, the meetings and everything to do with this, to what to do with the project. The women would make the tickets in their homes. There's no need for them to go to other areas or so, and they would still market them in the groups. Because remember we divided them into groups of 10 households. So they would, so they would take turns marketing these tickets and collecting income for, from these from this tickets. So, this project spoke more to women and women were involved in this project more and they benefited the most from this project. So it was a source of income to them. It was another source of livelihood to them. And also they acquired new skills other than just sitting at home and being concerned about only the domestic work. So yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for, for um bringing this, um, also the, the, the women engagement and um, the gender question here a bit, a bit uh, uh, more prominent. And um, you, you talked about, um, you talked about briquettes as a technology and this could, uh, will, will bring me actually to, will bring us to, um, to the last uh, point of this, of this conversation when we would like to talk a bit about, a bit more about um, the use of technology and um, it's a bit the same uh, when it comes to, let's say, modern technologies also, it's the same point with innovation, like what is your starting point, right? So for some uh, technology that is well uh, proven already in, in some areas might be completely new for other communities. So this is something um, uh, where you can see also the innovation part differs maybe from, from community to community. Um, so, but let's say modern technologies in community-based uh, work. What are your experiences? Uh, what were 
what are opportunities you see, but what were also gaps maybe in, in implementing the technology and maybe also like Gabi said in the beginning, seeing technology as a tool to reach your, your, your goals, right? And not as a purpose for itself um, um, because you just see like, okay, it's a fancy technology, we need it, but it's maybe not fitting into, into the community's uh, needs. But I know from all of your projects, you, you, you have something to, to share when it comes to, to the use uh, of technology. Um, I would uh, ask um, uh, Elizabeth to start and sharing some examples from her work in, in, in Kenya, uh, how to engage, especially for instance, the, the young people uh, by using uh, um, modern technologies. What, what kind of technologies did you use and, and uh, what was your overall approach there? So Elizabeth, I would ask you to share some examples with us. Okay, thank you, Anna, once again. Um, at Hopraisers, like I said, it's a user-led organization and we all know that youth are very good in adapting to technologies. And it's obvious that uh, when you give youth a problem, they will definitely solve innovative way using various technologies. And that's what uh, we have been doing. We have been using very innovative in in our project in almost in all our projects we have been using various uh, ways and very innovative and technology to actually address issues in our community and uh, this project about uh, adaptation climate adaptation which we which was called future yetu future yetu means our future uh, in it's a swahili word Yet it means our, and uh, we were using digital storytelling. Like we all know, storytelling is the oldest form of uh, communication which has been used across across the world to actually educate, warn, inform people, inspire people, and that's what we we used. And then we digitized the that form of communication so that we can be able to share the information about climate change and create awareness around the issue. And uh, what we actually do is train the community and give them the skills about on uh, digital storytelling, from storytelling, starting from the storytelling to actually creating videos that are very, uh, which are very short, about two, two minute story. You can give your personal story about your experiences in, your in, in our community so that you can be able, which is very short. And obviously because uh, when you give a long story, people get bored. And then how do you make that story of yours very interesting? So we train them on how plot development, script writing, audio and visual and video recording. Then they create their own story in that even if we are not in the community at the moment, people can still continue to give their stories, to give their stories uh, on the issues that is affecting them. And uh, so on Future Year 2, we, we actually did that and we trained um, some of the community members to tell their story and they told their stories which were very powerful and we have even started seeing the influence it has caused. Um, there were so many stories, uh, but I will talk about this particular story. One of our participants talked about how she has been doing uh, greening the greening the area and so many youths have, all, have come together to actually try and do the same. So it was very inspiring. It has in, inspired so many groups and they, ask, they have also come together to actually do the same, which, which has helped to pull resources uh, at the community level. Um, using digital storytelling has obviously helped and 
given us opportunity, especially as youth, to actually help community gain technological skills. Because uh, when it comes to like creating of a video, youth are very good and they get, they, they will understand faster how to create a video compared to the older generation. However, it's very interesting because the, also the older generation is very good in storytelling, how the story flows and uh, they work together. Even when, uh, because of COVID, uh, there was a question about COVID, how we, are, we were adjusting. We had to separate the youth groups and the elders because of the social distancing guidelines from the government. And one of the common questions we were asked by our elders is where are the youth? Because they know, because they, know they need youth to actually help them create the video and it will be faster. And that shows how even such a kind of tool bring the community together and bring the community together and work in unity. Uh, yeah, in unity. Another opportunity is that um, the, that form, that tool is very, it has, it, it's one of the most, I have never seen such a tool that will create and bring out the local knowledge in a way that storytelling brought because each person was giving their personal stories and their yeah. personal experiences and how they are adapting because we all know when it comes to climate adaptation is that there's no one short fit for the community how they can adapt each it changes from household to household from gender they have a different way of adapting to climate change and when they are giving their stories and personal stories you can hear how each and every person, each and every group is actually adapting and uh, how they are using that and the local knowledge that was in those, that could be extracted in those kind of stories, which was very, uh, that was one of the most, uh, something that we did not see uh, at the beginning, but it came out so well when we were actually now on the project. Um, there were so many, of course, there were so many advantages of using the tool, even some of them we didn't actually, we did not see at first, but they came out so well. Um, we also actually exhibited uh, using Matatu so that we can reach more people from the stories that were created by, uh, it was around 25 people who created the story, but then we exhibited uh, the story and screened in Matatu. Matatu is a public uh, transport in Kenya, which we had to reach more people and to see if they understand and they relate to the stories. And for sure, they actually related to the stories, they connected to the stories. And that was actually our main, main agenda to help community to, uh, to actually connect within itself and tell their stories so that they can reach, we can reach the people who are unreachable, who always make the decision for us. Uh, we also had so many limitations. Uh, as you know, it's, um, it's actually an informal settlement, so there's low income level. And as much as we encourage people to tell the stories using the small tool, the mobile phone, we are having the smartphone because training them, we expect them to actually go to the, to the community and reach out and teach other people and train their colleagues, wherever they are, how to tell the stories. But, uh, the fact that it's a low income area, there is a problem of like uh, people may not access uh, smartphones, which is um, is a challenge or there's electricity is actually unreliable. Generally, because in Kenya, we don't have that reliable because of definitely, of course, because of also climate change. So these things are obviously related. Again, stories can be used to warn and discourage people. Uh, there's a story uh, from one of our participants that was talking about, uh, he was an activist and he was talking about being warned and threatened 
by his life. And that story, looking at it in a, in a different angle now, it can be used to warn people not to actually do certain things in our community because he was talking about how they were addressing environmental issues and he was threatened. And that can be used to, for example, if you want to become an activist, you can be, it can be used and then you are told, you know, so and so did this, we can also do this to you. And so as much as storytelling is very powerful, it is also powerful in, in the other side. And that means that we have to be even more careful when we are also giving those kind of um, such when we are using such kind of tool. However, it's had a lot of uh, opportunities for us. And I would encourage each one of you to continue telling stories because it's reached so many people. And the fact that the stories are personal, people can relate with them and connect with each other as well. Yeah, it also brought together the, the government, which this form of a uh, disconnection between the government and community and when we're using such stories and we we the community is actually using the tool and telling this the stories it will it's kind of like was able to reach out because they can hear out what everyone is talking about and it's a very good form of um activism on the ground yeah, it's very good form of activism on the ground. Uh, but in general, it was very good and we enjoyed using it in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing these inspiring uh, stories. And I know also from, 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 from your outputs, from the videos and so on, how much engagement there was also on the community level and also intended or even unintended outcomes, right? I guess this was a really good, you, 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 you uh, shared this experience really good. And also this intergenerational uh, aspect that you see really old people using modern technology because the young people help them to, to use it, right? And then using it also as a multiplier to reach uh, more and more people. Uh, thank you so much. I would now turn to Mamoun. Uh, also, we, we have a question from the audience on, on the usage of, of digital and modern, let's say, technology. And I think, uh, Mamoun, you have a really good aspect that brings together this digital part, but also embedded it into, into the stakeholder environment. So uh, could you elaborate a bit more on, on your usage of, of technology? Yes, uh, well, uh, thank you, Arne. Uh, the the uh, uh, question from Gabby, I think one of the answer is here that the entry point with the youth group and entry point with the youth volunteers was the um, was the one of the technology we used that is the GIS ODK. So it's a simple Android application and Android apps also GIS ODK and we we mobilize the youth and um, give them some training and give them some orientation, give them some orientation to how to collect the data. That means the data from the household level and the household level, the vulnerable household, this, those are the in, in, from informal settlement. Uh, women, particularly the women-headed household and indigenous uh, household, we collected their um, uh, household data and also the um, geo reference data, that means the GIS data. So by um, collecting the data, data we um, analyze all of the data also presented on the <clears throat> uh, fast on the paper and we did a number of one thing i need to mention here this uh, technology uh, definitely gis uh, odk is a good technology and uh, it is now uh, using by number of community number of uh, organization communities i found number of people are using that uh, technology, but 
uh, one innovation from our uh, in one of the innovation is to use the technology with the social mobilization tools and social mobilization tools and method uh, that is the more important uh, how you are uh, popularizing how you are utilizing the technology uh, and how community are adapting this technology that is the main uh, factor and uh, for in order to in order to ensure the community uh, engagement within the technology we did a number of uh, did, uh, our groups uh, did number of activities uh, they, first of all they, we had trainings we had a uh, weekly meetings we had a courtyard meetings we had a coordinator coordination meeting with the public authorities uh, because the uh, when you are when we, your volunteers are collecting data that need to be validated by the citizen that need to be validated by the uh, informal settlement residents that means women household and also by the public authorities so uh, there are a number of events and there are a number of uh, series of meetings, series of co coordination and it's not only formal, uh, there are a number of informal events like uh, informal meeting, yeah, phone call, chatting, messaging, so this kind of engagement was there and uh, one of the events I need, I want to mention that is a public display. So. When uh, the data are collected, when data is validated, then we prepared a, a digital map so with the uh, plan of the climate resilience plan, with the points, with the water line, with the uh, future road connection, with the future emergency exit point, uh, women's safe space, bathrooms, um, latrines. So water point. So those things we uh, may, uh, the community mentioned on the uh, uh, GIS ODK and that mentioned in the uh, meetings mentioned in the four-year session, and that was that that is visible on the plan. And we uh, we prepared the map with the with their plan, with their dream, with their wishes, and we made it a. a billboard and we set up in front of the slum so people can see the we um the, this is our plan this is our future development plan this is our future uh, climate resilience plan so people can monitor and one uh, not only the people can monitor but also the uh, this plan is uh, reminding the public authorities when they are planning the any budget when they are planning the future plan so um, uh, the main point the technology this uh, gis ODK technology is a uh, it's worked very well one uh, one thing we tried that is the we tried to ensure we tried to validate the ownership data uh, that means the land tenure ownership uh, or land tenure security by the gis data but it, it was not worked very well because the ownership of the land with the number of uh, department and uh, with the state and uh, with the um, Port authority so uh, that that did not work very well but the um, climate resilience planning the priority and needs of the community that came up very well by using the technology with support of the social mobilization tools and methods uh, that we work thank you thank you Rana. Thank you so much, Mahmoud, for sharing this and also for mentioning the, um, the opportunities, but also the restrictions of, of the use of technology, right? And this brings me maybe to a follow-up question. Um, we organized a few weeks ago together also with IAD uh, a session on data at the Innovate for City, Innovate for, for, for Climate. And um, the question came up about data security. Right. If you work with uh, informal communities and you work also with the local governments, um, and I know that Ahmed uh, might be also able to share something from, from the Somalia issue there. How do you ensure or how or is it even is it even a topic within the community of what is what is the 
data used for, is shared with the government. Could you just elaborate on this? I know it's a bit sensitive uh, point, but it's an important point if you introduce technology. Mamoun, do you have any any example on this, or how did you see yes, this? Uh, yes, I yeah, yeah, very good question because um, the, the, there's a uh, one of the one of the concern and one of the uh, risk area the safety security of the data because you know, we are collecting we are collecting the individual personal data like uh, household data and uh, uh, there are number of income classification of house uh, yeah. Uh, children, household members, education, income source. So lots of data we are collecting and uh, within the data, uh, uh, that's an important thing that how we are managing the data and uh, how who, are, who have the access with the data and where we are preserving the data. So particularly uh, we used, we uh, upload all of the data with a platform that's uh, with a platform and there are a number of platform but we had a contract we had a MU uh, we have a MU with um, uh, the platform the cadastra platform and uh, we uploaded all of the data and uh, we also PPR represented the data with the dashboard so uh, all of the data and only uh, within the platform we have only uh, two access one is program manager and another is our technical person so only the people who have access to the uh, platform they can accessing the data and they can they we have also the data security guidelines so organizationally each and every staff are bounded uh, to not to take any kind of data so uh, that's the way we manage the data but um, uh, at the planning level at the in the uh, uh, public level uh, the data is not open for all uh, and but the, at the planning level we presented the how many percentage of data, like uh, how many percentage of household are under, uh, below the um, income level, how many percentage of household are women in it, how many percentage of household are uh, migrated from the cities or settle in the cities for last six months. So this kind of information uh, we presented with our, but we didn't share the individual name of the data. That's, that's from our experience. Thank you. Um, so if we have que questions from the audience as well, please feel free to either, either um, write in the chat or raise your hand if you can. Um, otherwise as well, I'll turn back again to the group and I know that some of these initiatives that you're presenting today, they are um, kind of a, con uh, a continuation of previous work that you have done. For some of you, these were completely new pilots. But I would like to learn a little bit more. Um, now you have kind of concluded at least one first um, phase, let's put it that way. Um, what is next? How, how do you plan? What are you planning next? And what are some of the challenges that you can already foresee um, to continue the work that you are doing to create sustainability for these interventions and to institutionalize even them? So maybe we can start with uh, Elizabeth from Kenya. Uh, we also have just a moment before that, we also have one of our participants here sharing uh, an opportunity. So there, is, there is a fund, uh, GS, GS, uh, GSMA fund, that will be launched um, in a few hours. So that's great. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, like moving ahead, uh, we definitely. We are. We have obviously completed the first phase and the first pilot uh, project, which, uh, from the stories, we actually realized that uh, one of the major problems that our community is facing is um, air pollution, 
And we had to actually come with a prototype that create a solution for that air pollution that was a carbon sink. And it was implemented in a school because like we are saying it's future year to our future means that it's the future and the future is our children. And uh, we implemented that prototype about planting trees, which involved even planting um, fruit trees because of the food insecurity in the area. And um, that was supposed to be the first project. Then it is it was supposed to be initiated in other schools. But uh, however, they have they we have a lot of problems at community level. There's some politics that we didn't plan for that came in, but we are trying to continue with our project and we had to solve certain kind of those politics that we and other things that we didn't foresee, but we are continuing to grow that kind of uh, prototype, to continue with the prototype project that is Carbon Sick Pocket. We named them like that because they're solving a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's acting as a carbon sink. And um, we are also continuing to tell stories within the community and we are encouraging our community leader, leaders and all those we trained to actually continue to tell the stories so that they can reach. Because when each and every community member go, goes to the community and teaches someone else who doesn't know about storytelling and they tell the stories and they tell the stories and we will have so many people telling their stories and it will be so hard for them the government and uh, to ignore our voices because we will be having um, a lot of voices speaking and we will be speaking in, in one language. And so our main thing that we are doing is actually to continue with the prototype. We are, we are planning to actually go to the other schools now and, um, and also to actually continue telling stories, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, Angela, if you could uh, summarize in less than two minutes, because we are reaching the end of our session, unfortunately, that would be great. What are the next steps um, for tree adoption in Uganda and the work that you have been doing with the communities there? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the next steps we are planning to scale up the project to other parts of Boise, uh, the project was mainly in Boise too. So we're planning to scale up the projects to other parts of Boise and also take the projects to other slums in Kampala, like in Uganda and in the rest of the slums. We're also planning to help the women who have been participating in this project. So we want to help them with packaging, packaging their products so that they can be more marketable to other people and other communities. So we're also planning to explore the side of plastics also. We want to continue partnering with plastic companies so that they can, so while the women are collecting the organic material, organic waste, they can also collect the inorganic waste. And these plastic companies can buy this waste from them. And they can also get income from plastic, from plastic waste. Thank you very much, Angela. Mamun, what's next uh, for Bangladesh? You are on mute. Yes, we, we have lots of thinking. Um, uh, we, we, we are continuing to work with the uh, Basically, we are working. For, we are working with the community and public authorities and other stakeholders, uh, all of them together. And um, that is uh, that is one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the strong strong area that we are we are continuing. And uh, second thing, we are uh, we are planning to. Um, the, uh, this approach, this data-driven uh, advocacy and uh, 
development of the climate resilience plan need to need to replicate with um, by the by the public authority and also um, with the other cities authorities uh, so we are planning to um, document all of this uh, result and to do some kind of meeting advocacy with the um, there is a municipality association of bangladesh mayor so we will do some kind of advocacy with mayor and uh, in the, after this uh, meetings uh, we think that this uh, this approach could be replicated with other municipalities so that is our plan to thanks mamun uh, let me check if ahmed was already able to come back ahmed are you there if yes, please unmute. Okay, I don't think so. Um, just to, to also mention something very interesting about this project in Somalia is that they used, um, the initial plan was to use as well SMS as a way to mobilize communities and prepare them in, in the view of a disaster. Um, and in the way, one of the things that they found is that, that that's a, good, a great um, tool. But uh, it would also, we would also need to use the radio um, because it's for you to really reach everybody in the area, uh, you really need to use like uh, several tools together. Um, so, but you can learn more about this project and also contact Ahmed um, through the, the website that I shared before. So we reached the end of our session and Ahmed, I'll pass it off to you so we can quickly recap as well some of the key messages. Ahmed or Arne? Arne. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm trying. Thank you. Thank, thanks to all of you. Really a rich uh, and uh, really rich discussion, I think. Some of my po key point of, uh, points are here when it comes to bringing the community together. It's always good to identify a common problem. Uh, speaking the same language um, and connecting abstract topics like climate change to daily problems. This was, uh, I guess, the main main part. Also, community involvement uh, takes time, so so you have to be patient. Um, you can use community platforms. You might have established also stakeholder platforms with the government to address uh, other topics uh, like violence against women or COVID topics and on the technology we also learned a lot I guess uh, and what stuck to stick to me is really also using the technology as a multiplier like thinking ahead of if you start this this can even turn into something bigger than you might expect so this would be my uh, key points uh, Gabi you want to compliment yeah, I just have a few final points to complement. Uh, one of the things that we can observe throughout all the projects is how you really listen to, to the community. So it's not um, the things that you have implemented, you have done with the community. So you're not something external to the community. So the community is not just um, a beneficiary. They are part of the project and they help taking the decisions and on how the, the project will move forward. Another point is the digital tools as a way or to, to start or reinforce um, social bounds with the community. So it's not just about the territory again, it is also about the social aspect of what is uh, what, what does it mean to be a community. Um, digital literacy and the gap, but also complementarities between generations. So for you, everybody to be truly, in, any, anything to be truly inclusive, we need to involve all groups um, in the things that we are doing. And something interesting from Kenya, for instance, is the power of stories. Um, so you can also use that to reach other people that are not uh, necessarily from the community, but also you can create this link between the groups and make them understand um, each other's context a bit, um, a bit better. On data, um, also the question of privacy. This is something very important, especially when we are talking about informality and very sensitive information. And finally, how you have also involved kids and the youth and the power that this can bring, you know, to instill and educate the new generations um, so we can probably have a different future. That will be it 
from my side. Um, Arne? Thank you, Gabi. And thanks to all the pan panelists. I guess this was a really interesting discussion. I hope you, you, you enjoyed it as much as, as we did. Um, thanks also to IID again for offering this platform for us. And also thanks to Storytile, uh, the technician behind all of this uh, that makes this, this session so smoothly happening. And yeah, I guess we reached the end of our session. I hope you will... Oh. Just before. a final thing that I, I forgot, okay. sorry. Uh, sure. So we are, as I said before, we do have this knowledge component uh, in our innovation mechanism, and we are compiling all these insights, all the learnings from, from these individual projects. And we will soon, hopefully by the end of this year, we will release and public, um, make it public all our findings um, on how and, and why we should invest more on climate adaptation at the community level. Very important to mention this. And again, you can find all the information of the different projects either on our website or also through their websites and, and, and social media. Yeah, and then hopefully you will enjoy some of the other sessions uh, at the development days. And with this, I would uh, end this session. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you all. Bye-bye.